Welcome everyone uh, to this week in Africa. And that's where there's a collaboration between Authentic African and African Stream. And uh, where we break down the top news of the day from last week um, with people who've reported the story um, and take a look at some of the other stories from around the continent. So today, uh, the main headline we're gonna cover is from prisoner to president. Uh, President Fai of Senegal, his election, who he is, what he's about. Uh, and then we have a few other stories that we are going to discuss. We're going to go over um, a little bit about an update around what happened in Niger with uh, Niger kicking out the U.S. military. We will also be discussing uh, the uh, what is going on in the DRC. And then lastly, some updated uh, comments um, from Gaddafi's um, one of his uh, major uh, advisors on how the African Union could have helped save him in 2011. So uh, that's overall what we'll be covering. And so, uh, but, but first, uh, I think we should do some introductions. I've done a lot of talking. I would introduce myself second, but first, I think we should have our, uh, our co-hosts introduce themselves and then I'll introduce myself next. Okay, greetings. I'm super happy to be on. My name is Inem. Um, I am a journalist with African Stream. I'm based out of Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk about all of these updates. Um, yeah, and to be back on the show for the second episode. Absolutely. And, and we did this about two weeks ago. Last week, we were unable to do so because of some travel. Um, but the idea is we will be doing this weekly. And of course, my name is Joe Hitagua. I'm an American born uh, Sierra Leonean. I repatriated from the U.S. to West Africa in 2020, so I've been living here in Ghana and in Sierra Leone. Uh, I, my platform that I run is called Authentic African, um, and the idea is that we focus on Pan-African breaking news, activism, culture, and history, and the goal is to bridge the gap between Africans and the diaspora. So with that, Let's jump into today's story. So uh, the first story, as I mentioned, is from prisoner to president. And, and the reason why we titled it that way is because that is the case. Uh, president Fai has a very interesting background in the story. Um, and because he was just elected last week, and we did speak about it briefly last week, we wanted to kind of do an update. So um, let me kind of just read through a little bit about him and uh, we'll watch a couple of videos that will kind of give a little bit more context and then we will react to it and, and hear your thoughts. So um, in a change of fortunes fit for a fairy tale, Senegal's Fai has transformed from prisoner to president of his country in less than three weeks. The 44 year old Pan-African was sworn in as the sixth Senegalese leader on April 2nd after a convincing win in last month's presidential election. Uh, Fai's path to the presidential palace was full of twists and turns. Initially, he was not even supposed to be on the ballot. He came in as a replacement candidate after his comrade and mentor, Sunko, was disqualified over charges many saw as politically motivated ploy by the then president, Sal, uh, to clip the wings of Sunko, a youthful firebrand politician who since 2021 has led nationwide demonstrations against uh, the Saul administration. Uh, the protests reached a crescendo when Saul tried uh, to move elections from February to October. Uh, they not only pressured him into moving back the election date to March, they also led to the release of political prisoners, including Fai and Sanko. So in the days after leaving jail, Fai, uh, Fai uh, trounced um, Amadou Ba, the candidate of Saul's coalition. Uh, now that he's crossed the election hurdle, Fai has a task of uniting the nation that underwent months of social unrest and also deliver economic growth to meet the needs of millions of citizens whose soldiers he uh, was carried on um, from the prison to the palace. Uh, I will also say that um, by choosing Fai, uh, the Senegalese have obviously chosen a new direction. Um, he's obviously a younger president. He's technically um, Africa's youngest elected president. Uh, and I think what we'll show now is some two videos of, of um, what this can mean for the greater economic sovereignty of Senegal um, and basically a kick in the teeth to the French neo-colonial interests. So with that, let's queue up the videos and take a look. Fidelement, la charge de président de la République du Sénégal. 
The present to palace fairy tale is complete. Basihu Diome Fair has been sworn in as Senegal's new president. He was released from jail just days before the end of March election. Fair won it in a landslide, collecting 54% of the vote. It was his first shot at the top job. For years, he had been the right-hand man of youthful opposition figure Usman Sonko. Sonko led the protests against undemocratic maneuvers by former President Macky Sall. But Sonko was disqualified over disputed moral corruption charges and so backed Fair. Sonko has now been appointed as his prime minister. Fair has his work cut out once the post-election euphoria ends. Expectations are high, especially among the young who were key to his victory. Many want to see a departure from Sal's pro-France posture. Faye has pledged systemic change and to defend Senegal's sovereignty. He's also vowed to renegotiate oil, gas and mineral contracts with foreign operators. If he delivers, Senegal could be a beacon for the new Africa. Okay, so we have another video to Riding play. a wave of enthusiasm, Basiro Diomaye Faye is set to be Senegal's new president. His main competitor conceded defeat based on preliminary results from Sunday's election. The Constitutional Council is expected to announce final results on April 3rd. Born in 1980, he hails from the West Central region of Senegal and has worked as a federal tax inspector. There he met his mentor, Usman Sanko, and they worked to form a labor union. The two had also protested former President Macky Sall, who had been in office since 2012. He congratulated Faye. In April 2023, Faye and Sonko were arrested on different charges, amidst mass uprisings where about 1,000 people were jailed. But 10 days before the election, they were released from a Dakar prison. Nous entendons tourner cette page pour réconcilier les cœurs, réconcilier les Sénégalais et nous mettre inlassablement au travail qui devra mar marquer et réaliser l'espoir qui a été suscité par mon élection et le projet dont je suis le porteur. 44-year-old Faye is popular among young voters. More than 60% of the country is under 25 and struggle to find jobs. He says he wants to tackle corruption, reform regional body ECOWAS, and push for economic sovereignty. That includes ditching the West African CFA franc, a vestige of ongoing French colonialism. This comes amidst a wave of recent military coups that kicked France out of three Sahelian states. He also plans to renegotiate mining and hydrocarbon contracts for production set to begin this year. Je m'engage à gouverner avec humilité dans la transparence. All right. So, uh, there was a lot there. I think there's a lot of promises to be made and there was a lot to talk about. So I, I did do a brief like introduction to to Fai and um, you know the fact that he was part of the opposition party, and um, and they in these videos they discuss what he you know what his role was previously was a tax inspector and then that's where he met his mentor. Uh, they also mentioned all the things that he's looking to do. I think going away from the CFA is huge, and uh, there were a couple other things that he needs to tackle. So I, I'd love to hear from you, um, you know. What are your thoughts on, you know, what his political agenda is and and the story leading up to his rise and, and what the general consensus was around him um, and the excitement around him and, you know, how he ended up winning the presidency? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, his rise to, to power and the seat of the presidency in Senegal is just a huge testimony to the power of, you know, grassroots organizing to mass mobilizations. Um, I mean, this has been years in the making. Um, you know, Senegal has been a hotbed of a lot of anti-imperialist movement on the ground, uh, kind of beginning sort of around 2018 with the frustration towards Macky Sall's uh, really pro-French economic policies. Um, we saw movements like France de Gage, which means like France, like get out of here, um, 
waged by somebody called, uh, or an organization called the uh, Front for an Anti-Imperialist Popular and Pan-African Revolution, aka FRAP. So you can you can Google that acronym. They've really been at the forefront of campaigning first for Usman Sonko, who we'll talk about in a bit, and then for Jomai Fai, who ended up being the candidate representing uh, that same party. So just to say, you know, we've seen protests for years and years and years now. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of concern that Macky Sall would illegally, you know, uh, change, you know, or, or manipulate the Constitution uh, to stay in power for longer. And so I think it's, it's uh, amazing to see, you know, that really it was organizing on the ground that led to this moment. Um, as for his promises, you know, I, um, I will say, like, right now, initially, like him coming to power, there's a little bit of like having to toe the line and to give kind of a softer rhetoric, but that is kind of normal. We see, uh, we've seen this sort of thing with, you know, Ibrahim Traore at the very beginning, with Goita and of Mali at the very beginning. So if you pay attention to some of the current rhetoric, there is a lot of like, um, you know, our partners don't have anything to be worried about. So hopefully this is just something that's strategic because the campaign for years and years leading up to this moment has been one that's been very staunchly anti-imperialist. And so I think the two things that will really define his presidency will be the CFA franc. Will Senegal get a truly sovereign currency um, not tied to France in any way? Um, that would be huge. It would change, you know, the the economic reality of Senegal. And then the other big thing, the other barometer um, will be Senegal's relationship with the alliance of Sahelian states next door. Um, you know, how will Senegal now position itself next to its neighbors who have taken a very, very clear and strong anti-imperialist stance? If Senegal is now on this path uh, to be a true ally, maybe member of the alliance of Sahelian states, uh, it's going to transform the development of, you know, that sort of trajectory by having now a country that is on the coast uh, really in close collaboration with these three landlocked states um, yep. that are fighting really, really hard to delink from the West. Absolutely. And and one of the things I heard him say was, or what they said he was on his agenda, is transforming ECOWAS. And it seems like there's kind of a need for a bridge between the Sahelian states and ECOWAS, and maybe Senegal could potentially be that, and, and fake uh, FI could be that. So it could be. It'll be interesting to see how those how that uh, you know unfolds over the next few months. Um, on that topic, uh, you know, there are two more videos we do want to play in uh, relation to this election because I think one, you know, we want to talk more a little bit about Fai, but also his um, mentor Sanko. And so I'm going to read through a little bit here, and then we'll, we'll go to those videos. So you know. One of the things I think is really important to know is that he he secured 53.7% of the vote while the ruling party's um, candidate, um, ba, uh, Amadou Ba, only had 36% of the vote. So it was an overwhelming win. Um, and Ba conceded uh, defeat pretty early on. It was pretty obvious that uh, the win went to, to Fai. And Fai, an opposition political leader, Sanko helped spark mass uprisings in 2019 while campaigning for office. So Fai vowed to develop a sovereign currency and move out of the colonizer France's sphere, uh, among other promises that won the hearts of the country's primarily unemployed youth. And so I do want to talk a little bit about Sanko, um, who's now been named prime minister. So this is his, his um, Fai's mentor. So now you, in essence, you kind of have these two leaders that uh, are both forward thinking and both anti-imperialist that now are running the show, right? So newly sworn in president, um, Fai has tapped his mentor and popular opposition figure, Sanko as Senegal's prime minister. Uh, this comes just a few years after a mass movement engulfed the small West African country protesting undemocratic practices and French economic control. Uh, Sanko caught public attention in 2016 as a whistleblowing tax inspector who alleged a Canadian company was operating in Senegal to evade $8.9 million in taxes. And so in 2019, Sanko placed third in the election running against then incumbent president Mackie Small, who's been president um, up until recently. Uh, the 49 year old distinguished himself by railing against the neo-colonial West African CFA franc currency and Frank, French domination of the economy. I think it's also important to note that they're both under 50 years old. So young 
and energetic, right? In 2021, Sanko was arrested and charged with um, sexual assault and um, a move that many saw as a political um, repression. Uh, this sparked mass protests that led to youth uh, and workers pouring into the streets. In 2023, a court dismissed that charge, instead convicting Sanko of corrupting Senegal's youth, which is interesting. So last year, Saul announced that he would not run for office and that the Senegalese uh, Constitutional Council maintained Sanko was also disqualified from running. So then at that point, Sanko endorsed 44-year-old Fai, who won in March uh, and was sworn in as president April 2nd. So now that's kind of the full story of Sanko. Uh, so with that, let's queue up the videos and um, watch those two in response. President Basiru Jomai Fai has tapped for Prime Minister his mentor Usman Sonko, a popular opposition candidate barred from running in the 24 March presidential election. Que je mesure la confiance et l'importance de la confiance qu'il a placé à notre personne. Sanko had run in the 2019 election against Western allied former President Macky Sall, placing third but gaining popularity due to his anti-imperialist positions. C'est nous qui assurons notre stabilité, c'est pas la France. From 2021 to 2024, protests broke out across Senegal in support of Sanko, who many hailed as a symbol of democracy in opposition to Sall, who was believed to be after an illegal third term until he announced last year that he wouldn't run. Sonko was disqualified from contesting in the 2024 election after he was convicted of corrupting the youth. Upon endorsing Fai for president, his supporters rallied behind the new candidate. <laughs> and his chosen Prime Minister Sanko are at the head of Senegal. New President, Basiru Jomai Fai. So right. who is he and uh, why so, young Senegal? Um, that voice obviously sounds familiar. So, <laughs> so um, I think I'll just turn it over to you since you were the one who produced the video and that was your voice on the video. I uh, do you want to speak more to Sanko and his background and, and how Senegal uh, obviously you know, responded to the charges because obviously those are the first charge was a very serious charge, but it's it's interesting that you see that they completely switched charges to something completely different. So it seems as though it um, it aligns with the with what people thought in the general public. So can you speak to that a little bit and where it led to and, and how Sanko is is now uh, prime minister? Okay, so first thing I'll say, you know, Sonko is a huge figure in Senegal at this point. I mean, uh, Joe Mai Fai, of course, is the president. Uh, Sonko is the PM. But um, I think we shouldn't underestimate how influential that uh, Sonko himself is. Uh, you know, the fact that he announced that Joe Mai Fai was the candidate that he was endorsing. Um, and that was then the candidate that was elected. So um, I think we should see this as not just a, a Fai victory, but really a Sonko Fai Sort of victory and like a Sonko Fai type of uh, leadership. Um, you know, as for his, you know, he's been in and out of prison. Fai, Fai was also incarcerated. Um, I will say the, you know, it's a, it's a very, obviously it's a sensitive subject, but the sexual assault allegations weren't really taken very seriously by the majority of the Senegalese people. Um, it was always assumed that he was um, mostly being targeted for his politics and for being an opposition figure towards Sal. Um, and then since then, he's been slapped with all sorts of different charges. So there's corrupting the youth, there's inciting insurrection, you know, various types of charges that are basically insinuating that he's guilty of like rallying up and, uh, you know, energizing the masses in a way that is, was uh, not beneficial to Macky Sal and his, uh, uh, his administration. Um, so that did end up being what they were sort of able to uh, uh, convict him of and, and it, corrupting you specifically allow, um, rendered him ineligible to, uh, to contest. Uh, then he was released from prison, which I think is also very interesting. He was pardoned kind of at the last minute. And, you know, I, the way I interpret it is I think it was, you know, just it was too bad of a look for, for Sal to keep him there. You know, I, I don't know if anything happened or not behind the scenes that we don't know of. But I do think that at a certain point, Sal had to recognize that his party is, it was just no way that 
Um, you know, it's, it's been years of serious protests. Um, and I think it was like just a risky situation that could have ended up being um, an actual insurrection, similar to maybe what we have, we've seen in the past in Burkina Faso in 2014, when the people, you know, uh, overthrew uh, Blaise Compare. You know, not quite the same because uh, Sal hasn't been in power nearly as long, but um, there's been a lot of building frustration. It's been cycles of this. Abdoulaye Wad, the, the previous president of Senegal, uh, was overthrown in a similar way. There was a, it's a, we see kind of like a, a repetition where there were concerns that a president who uh, had sort of this neo-colonial position or positioning uh, was going to potentially illegally claim a third term. Uh, and then there was like a rise up. And unfortunately, last time this happened, we got Macky Sall. Um, and so I think, you know, hopefully there's been a push towards more kind of ideological clarity. It's not just this time that we don't like Macky Sall, but much more clarity around what our actual objectives are, which are, you know, we don't want uh, to be a French neo-colony. We don't want to have these sort of imperialist relationships. And then with, again, the alliance of, Sahelians, of Sahel states right next door, like now we have this model. I think there's a lot of pressure that um, on the shoulders of uh, Jomai Fai and Sonko saying, okay, we have to live up to this expectation of what the people clearly want. Um, so I think this, this, will, this is a potential to be really big. Um, and it, it really does need for the grassroots, the people of Senegal to keep pushing and to keep being very, very clear about like what their expectations are. Absolutely. And I, I love to see the will of the masses uh, come to fruition, right? I mean, this is super important. You know, something we talk about living in the West, right, is, you know, our freedom of speech and the right to assembly and all of those things. Um, and a lot of times you don't necessarily see the outcomes you'd like to see. Um, and clearly you saw that here in Senegal, right? First of all, they were released from prison because they were what it seems like were unjustly in prison. Um, and then a free and fair election actually was run and um, the will of the people, um, you know, was what came to fruition. So that's, that is encouraging to see, um, you know, so that's, that, so that's the kind of thing we want to see. So that, that is um, a, a, a step in the, in the right direction. Um, so with that, I think we want to, um, in the interest of time, we were going to talk about, and maybe this is a conversation for another time, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I think is interesting about Phi is um, is the the fact that he is in a plural marriage, uh, but in the interest of time, maybe we can go to other stories. But that's something we could potentially talk about later because I think that can be an interesting element um, to understanding culturally what's going on in Senegal and um, and just some of the things here in West Africa and what that means to have two first ladies um, with one president, right? Uh, but we'll we'll table that for another time. Um, so I thought we could then go into some of the other headlines from around the continent. I know last last time we got together, we talked about the uh, the U.S. military being kicked out of Niger, right? Um, there was there was a, a discussion about how the agreement that was signed basically said that the U.S. military can operate without explaining to Niger what they're doing. Right. They can have all kinds of operations, do what they want and do not have to explain it to them, which is interesting. Right. You're in someone else's country, but you can do what you'd like. And I think um, it was deemed unconstitutional. Right. And so they were removed um, or they were asked to exit uh, by the ruling junta um, earlier this year. So there's been two uh, major updates since then. And so we're going to go through each one of them individually. The first is uh, the U.S. was to submit um their exit plan so i think if we can put that up on the screen since it's a it's a picture not a video we can share that up on the screen and then we can kind of talk through it um, but while that's coming up i'll kind of talk through what it means so uh nigeria is giving the u.s military to boot as i said before and uh says the pentagon will submit an exit plan um it's obviously a blow to washington which spent 110 million dollars um on its base in central niger at the same time um they're exploring other options when it comes to security partnerships, including potentially Russia, and it's bolstering defense ties with revolutionary Pan-African neighbors, Burkina Faso and Mali. Um, so on, on these, the, the, this exit plan and the picture here, it says um, they'll submit a, a proposal on disengaging troops from the country. On March 16th, um, they withdrew from 
a 2012 security accord with Washington that allowed the Pentagon to operate in Niger. About 1,000 US military personnel are stationed in the $110 million drone base in central Niger. Um, the Junta is exploring new defense partnerships, as I mentioned. Uh, March 26th, General, um, uh, is it Tichani? Tichan I always get his name wrong. Um, spoke to Vladimir Putin about um, uh, de uh, deepening security ties with Russia. Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso also for formed what they call the Joint Defense Pact, um, and they all exited the West-leaning West African ECOWAS bloc. So um, that's a little bit about you know the the plan to exit and what's been happening so far. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on this since this is kind of a new update since the the discussion about them uh, being asked to exit. Okay, um, you know. Uh, so my thoughts are kind of tied with the, the video that we're about to play. Um, I don't know, maybe we should play the video because I feel like I kind of want to respond to both. Um, okay. Because otherwise, cause I just, it's, yeah, I, I, there's okay. something I want to say, but if I say it now, uh, I'm going to end up repeating myself because it's super relevant to the video. Okay, so let me give a quick preamble to that and then we'll put the video up there. So, uh, so the video is, um, so uh, Matt Gates. Um, so, okay, well, let me read this and then we'll talk about that case. So, Niger's new assertiveness is not going down so well in the U.S. Congress. Last month, of course, um, it was announced by the Junta of Niger that the military cooperation in Washington was going to be uh, ended. And in this clip, you will see how Republican U.S. Congressman Matt Gates took the news. He lets rip his feelings um, at the commander. And, uh, and the head of the uh, the commander, uh, General Michael Langley, the head of the United States Africa Command or AFRICOM. Um, Gates points out that the U.S. invested 500 million in Niger, according to the investigative journalist Nick Terse, since 2016. It splashed out more than 250 million in, um, on an airbase in two, um, airbase 201, um, and with that drone base and. Um, Niger kicking out the Americans comes on the back of a wave of anti-imperialist uh, sentiment in the Sahel. And I just want to mention uh, our friend Matt Gates here. Um, in case you might see the name sounds familiar, he's known for uh, showing sexually explicit pictures and videos to his fellow Congress people on the Senate floor and the Congress. So that's that's what he's most known for, just in case you guys might recognize the name and recognize the face when you watch this video. That's his biggest contribution to, to date. But anyway, um, yeah, let's go ahead and play the video and then we can respond to the video as well. March 16th, 2023, Secretary Blinken calls Niger, quote, a model of resilience, a model of democracy, a model of cooperation. One year and one day later, Dr. Wallander, the spokesperson of the Nigeri military, Colonel Amadou Amabrame, says, quote, the American presence in the territory of the Republic of Niger is illegal. A, a year and a day after our government said they were the model of resilience and democracy, they are throwing us out by the scruffs of our neck. And so is it safe to say that this failed, General Langley? It's safe to say that there's no correlation or causation of U.S. training to a coup happening. Well, I, period. I mean, we've spent more than 500 million in the country. What can you say we've got for that 500 million as we sit here today? There was a, a buy down on uh, an insurance policy for protecting uh, the homeland. Depending okay, but General Langley, not. you went to Niger and, and, and you went to have a meeting with the people we trained who overthrew the democratically elected government, and Fox News is reporting that you didn't even get a meeting with the principal decision maker, is that right? I had a meeting with my counterpart. Well, uh, here's the quote. Sources say last week's meeting with the junta was extremely difficult. The administration's envoys did not get to meet with Niger's principal decision maker. Is that a true statement or is that a false statement? My responsibility is to meet with my counterpart not 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 i would not just know that if not we could train two leaders Gentlemen's we could time. at least book a meeting you know since it's the model of democracy Gentlemen.
All right, I have some thoughts, but I'd love to I'd love to hear your thoughts first, see them, please. Me too. I also have I also have quite a few thoughts here. I mean, okay, so I think we clearly should understand that in any sort of situation like this, you know, um, Niger giving the United States the boot, the United States is not going to be happy. Niger is a very, very, very important um, like strategic sort of hub for the United States military operations. The United States has invested more. Uh, in military operations in Niger than in any other country in Africa with the sole exception of Djibouti in the Horn of Africa. So this is really like, you know, this was AFRICOM, the US Africa Command's major, major, major base in West Africa that was also supposed to be, you know, the center of all their operations into Central Africa. So it's it, it was like um, really supposed to be something that uh, was supposed to be what their strongest, you know, center of operations. So this, uh, the, the coup that happened, you know, I imagine it was a major shockwave. Clearly, we're seeing that there's some level of serious upset um, within, you know, uh, the, the U.S. sort of political apparatus. So we have to understand, I don't think that, you know, the United States is going to leave and then that's it and it's all good and there's no consequences. I think we need to be really, really prepared right now as, as African people, wherever we are on the continent or in the diaspora, to you know, speak up to defend Niger's decision to make its own choices as to who it wants to collaborate with and who it doesn't. You know, we, we need to be really clear about defending uh, the all of the alliance of Sahel states right now, um, especially Niger, given that Niger was the first to kick out the U.S. military. Um, and and then you know, I I do anticipate and hope that Burkina and Mali will make uh, similar decisions. But I really don't think we should imagine that there's going to be no consequences. Um, I think we might see things like potentially some form of economic sanction or otherwise efforts to destabilize Niger through media propaganda, through, you know, trying to seed some sort of division within the state. These are the typical tactics that come up when this sort of decision is made. So I think we should all be very, very alert in terms of like, OK, how can we um, be very clear on terms of uh, Niger and what's going on and, and, and what the stakes are and why Niger is making this decision? Other thing real quick, you know, we have these kind of conversations. I think it came up during the last episode, like, why is the U.S. in Niger? You know, why does the U.S. have their military in Africa? You know, are, why, you know we say that, uh, you know, they say that they're fighting terrorists. And then we see that this problem of these paramilitary terrorist organizations are proliferating. This video, especially if you watch like the full thing, it makes it so clear that, you know, the United States is in Africa to protect the United States' interests. So in other parts of this video, um, this politician Gates is very upset that Niger is potentially going to work with Russia and Iran. Like that's totally unacceptable. How can this be happening? And it makes it just very, very clear that, you know, the reason why the United States wants to have this strong military presence is to make sure that African countries are closely aligned with the United States and US allies and not with countries that are in opposition to the United States, not towards uh, with countries that are on the other side of the geopolitical spectrum, like Russia, like Iran. So it's not about, you know, uh, any sort of protecting the people, you know, uh, making sure that the terrorist threat is reduced. It's about making sure that their geopolitical alignments are respected uh, and maintained. Well put. Um, so a couple of things that, uh, and you, you've said everything, I don't have anything more to say on your points because you really covered it. Uh, just a couple of things that I want to add to that. Um, number one, I think the, um, Matt Gates, you know, Obviously, it's political theater, right? A lot of times when you get up in front of Congress like that, they get two minutes to speak, right? So, of course, they're going to fiery whatever. They're getting sound, sound bites and clips that'll go up on Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, whatever. Um, but that was a bad faith line of questioning because the question was, you didn't meet with the sole decision maker when clearly the goal was to meet with his counterpart, which he, which he said three times or at least two times in that clip. And so if, if you are addressing who he was there to meet and he met with that person, that's who he was supposed to meet with. Most, the United States president does not meet with generals of another country. You meet with the president. So if you have a high ranking general, the high ranking general is supposed to meet with another high ranking general, not the person who's running the country, right? You meet with your counterpart. That's just a normal thing. I think as the United States, they expect because they're the big brother who's in charge of everything or would like to be, that um, 
they can have lower level people within the administration or within the military meet with the highest ranking person in a particular country, which is not customary for most country to country meetings. That's not how it normally works. But because I'm sure in his mind, he's thinking like we're America and you're just little Niger, your president needs to be meeting with one of our generals, which is not, or your leader should be meeting with one of our generals, which is not the way it goes. Um, so I think that was in bad faith, just speaking to that, because, you know, I, I think it was, you saw it in that clip, but I don't, it, you know, it's not really, wasn't much context given to that piece. And, and then the other question that he asked was, what did we get out of it? Um, we spent 500 million or whatever it was. Um, what you got out of it, the ability to spy and fly drones um, without any oversight since 2012. The agreement was signed in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, right? I know it was two weeks ago when we spoke about this, but I think the agreement was signed over 12 years ago. So you spent at least 10 years, let's say, um, being able to do what you want, however you want, um, without any oversight from the country you're in. So, you know, that was the $500 million prize you got. And so now, of course, they're going to decide that you no longer get to operate within that country. I think anybody would feel that way. Um, it's just common sense that anyone would feel that way. So, um, and then up to the last point, him saying that, that um, they are an example of democracy. I mean, you know, although it wasn't a democratically elite junta, it was the will of the people. Right. It's you know, when when the when the government was taken over, you saw elation and people responding um, in a way that looked a lot like your favorite candidate winning. Right. Um, in the streets. So to me, I, it, it, although it wasn't a democratically elected president it, or leader, it does seem as though that was what the will of the people. That was the will of the people. And so um, I just wanted to add that because I think that, you know, those two pieces, I don't think were um, really discussed in the video. Um, and that to me, you know, I, I, I see that as a bad faith argument on Matt Gates's part. And that's just kind of his his thing. That's what he does. Um, so I just felt like I had to address that directly. All right. Um, so on that, there is more about Niger. Um, oh, actually, that was that was all um, having to do with Niger. I'm just going to see if there are any comments on any, from anyone in the audience about Niger. I think everyone's just saying hello and, and joining in on the discussion. OK, so. Now I think we can shift gears a bit to uh, DRC, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, there are a couple of different stories here we want to talk about. One about just kind of people's everyday life. And then the other about Paul Kagame, which I think is interesting. Um, quick, like little side note, you know, I've been li since living on the continent for the last four years, I've been having a lot of conversations with people, people about, um, you know, the idea of, of democratically elected leaders versus, um, you know, benevolent dictatorship, right? And um, specifically having lived, not lived through, but having been in a country that has lived through a civil war in Sierra Leone and having had democratic elected leaders over, over time and not really seeing the progress we'd like to see, but then you see Rwanda, which has had a civil war, which obviously was depicted in a movie, Hotel Rwanda, if you guys haven't seen it, you should watch it. Don Cheadle did a great job in that movie. Um, and I thought that that was, so we, we would have these conversations about how Rwanda has done such a great job of coming out of that civil war and becoming, it seems like economically dependent, thriving, becoming a new center for places to, for people, for people to visit. Um, and so, over the last few weeks, thanks to African Stream, by the way, uh, I've become more aware of Rwanda's role in the DRC. And, um, and so I think what we'll, we'll talk about here now is, is what Rwanda's role is, and we'll watch a video, and then we'll talk about what everyday life looks like for people, specifically during Ramadan. But I just want to read this first. So, um, so what, what they say is, you know, Paul, President Paul Kagame, um, tacitly admit uh, the country's role in the illegal exploitation of resources from its neighboring war-torn DRC. He doesn't hide the fact that stolen minerals are funneled through Rwanda before being sold on international markets. According to him, his country is doing nothing wrong, unlike those that are doing the buying, such as Israel, the UAE, Russia, and Belgium. Meanwhile, the UN has called on Rwanda to stop supporting M23 rebels in Eastern DRC amid massacres and the forced displacement of thousands of people from the mineral rich land. 
often the land is then illegally mined and then extracted mineral metals are sold to multinationals multinationals via Rwanda. So for the record, Kangami denies supporting M23. Uh, maybe one day he'll admit that too. Um, so that's that's um, the story from uh, African Stream. So let's go ahead and play the video and hear what uh, Paul Kagami, President Paul Kagami from Rwanda has to say. Some very senior people recently from somewhere who are saying, no, the Congolese are saying we we steal their quarter, we steal their gold, and there's something I know. Some people come from Congo, whether they smuggle or go through the right channels, they, they bring minerals, and most of it goes through here, does not stay here. It goes to Dubai, goes to Brussels, goes to Tel Aviv, goes to Russia, it used to go to Russia, I don't know whether it still goes there. It goes everywhere. So I was asking them, I said, are you on the list of those who are stealing minerals of Congo? Because these things, they end up with you. For, for us, we are, we are now, they go through our country. But they are accusing us of stealing Congo's minerals. How about the destination? Why don't you talk about it? And, and if we, we actually deployed everything, every effort, and stopped this thing flowing, it would, the accusation would be even worse. Yeah, they would be seeing no, no, no more gold coming through here. Going to them, then they say, uh -huh, these people, are, they are causing problems. So what, what are we supposed to do, honestly? Hmm. What are we supposed to do? Inam, thoughts? Oh boy, what a problem for uh, Kagame. What is he supposed to do? I mean, Rwanda is, uh, is, is kind of playing a, a role some people might say like a sub-imperialist type of role where it's uh being able to uh, uh you know play sort of this middleman role have like certain resources this relative development compared to neighboring states and other african countries at the expense of the people of the drc um you know what a, what a problem to have uh Paul Kagame. you know i i would say that you know he's kind of the uh like a prime example of somebody who I would call like a comprador, you know, he's somebody who, uh, he, you know, even, even me, like what you were saying, even me, like living in Africa and I've, I've spent time in quite a few different places, at least in West Africa. Um, and I've seen, you know, there's a lot of popularity and support and, and love for Paul Kagame. And even here in Burkina, like, I'm just, I think we're just right now at a, uh, in a time where that's starting, starting to shift, you know, more and more people are like, Oh, hold on. Like I was wrong. Um, this is not the guy I thought, you know, he was. And I think it's because, you know, he has this charming rhetoric. He knows how to speak. He, um, he, he says the right things. At one point, there was a delegation of Burkina Bay that visited Rwanda. And Paul Kagame told them, you know, my inspiration is Tuma Sankara. And that mm. had a really big impact on the people who live here. Um, and I, I think it's kind of something to uh, critique among, you know, a lot of uh, the way... Uh, we as a people, and, and I'm sure other people of the world, I think this is not just an African thing, sometimes analyze things. Like I said, I think sometimes there's a tendency to really uh, go for the right words or the right sort of images and charisma. And we shouldn't forget that, you know, Mobutu, who brutally ruled over the DRC, was, you know, the one who had, you know, the African name. He changed the names of the streets in, uh, in, in the DRC. Um, you know, we're not saying... Uh, what is Leopoldville anymore? We're talking about Kinshasa, you know, wearing the African clothes. We saw the same thing in Haiti um, with Francois Duvalier, you know, the same thing with this sort of like, uh, you know, saying the right things, having the right sort of like attitude to some extent. But then behind the scenes, when you look at the practice, you know, we're talking about uh, a lot of violence towards 
regular African people in favor of a global imperialist system. And that's what we see in Rwanda. Um, we, we see that uh, through the plunder of the DRC, uh, Rwanda, specifically Kagame, has been able to kind of maintain this uh, position of relative, I guess, economic privilege. I mean, we know that Rwanda is still not, you know, on the UN Security Council. Rwanda doesn't really have a say in the IMF or the World Bank. Um, but I guess for this small relative privilege, um, you know, Kagame is willing to risk and cost millions of Congolese lives. And also not to, to not speak too long, but just to say, you know, so I live in Burkina Faso. Half my family is from Nigeria. I have no personal tie to the DRC, but I, you know, I have to say that the Democratic Republic of Congo is like the primary battleground for Pan-Africanists. It really is like the, honestly, like the most important state in terms of, you know, it ha it's, the, it's the heart of Africa's resources, more resources than any other country. Um, you know, it has uh, enough, from my understanding, fertile uh, farmland to feed the entire African continent several times over. The uh, hydroelectric power of the Congo River could provide electricity to the entire African continent and still have electricity uh, left over to export into Europe and parts of Asia. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah understood that the DRC really is like the primary battle for Pan-Africanists. Like it really will determine the destiny of this continent. Uh, he wrote a book that I encourage people to read, The Challenge of the Congo. Um, so just to understand, like this is not some light thing. Um, the DRC, what has happened, um, I mean, during, throughout the Kagame era, but really for generations and generations going back through the colonial era, it's just so important that we understand like this is the battle of all of us. You know, this is every African person needs to be paying very close attention to all of the developments in the DRC. Well put, yeah. And um, just to add to that, I think there, there was a couple things that I that I watched when I first saw that video. I was not ready for that response. I didn't think that's what I was, I didn't think that that's what I was going to get. Because what he said was whether illegally or legally, right, these things are coming through our country and then place the blame on the end destination, although they're not coming through, like they're coming through Rwanda, right? And so, you know, when you're knowingly benefiting from a criminal enterprise, that's part of a RICO case, right? Racketeering racketeering cases. That's something that people do. That's what they do now in the United States, right? Or your accessory to the crime. And so, um, you know, if in, in most legal instances, right, you can't sit in court and say, listen, I drove the getaway car, but it's not really me. I wasn't the one who broke in and stole it, or I wasn't the one who they sold everything to. I was just driving the getaway car. You don't, that's not something that you can walk away from and just and not have any liability in, in terms of that situation so to me i thought that that was really revealing that he would say um he would just probably he just try to put it on everyone else it's the uae it's russia it's everyone else it's not us i mean it's, it's coming through us legally or illegally but it's not us and what what should i do well you know you can stop the sale through other people you can find ways to do more business with the drc um i you know obviously as you mentioned um they're not on the UN Security Council. They don't have, um, you know, the, the the level of standing that they probably would like to have um, with, you know, some of the Western powers and some of the folks who, who make a lot of the major decisions globally. Um, but I think it would go a lot a lot longer if if he says that Thomas Sankara is one of his, um, you know, he's someone one of the people he I, uh, he. Um, I would say, uh, what was it? What was the phrase I want to say? If he if he says he's one of the people that he models himself after then um, what he's doing currently, what he's allowing currently, I should say, um, would have to cease immediately, right? Because that's obviously not something Thomas Sankara did or would do uh, based on what we know about him. So on that note, um, we come on the topic of uh, DRC and um, how this is impacting the people. There was a brief story that you guys did on um, Ramadan. So this is the holy month for those who practice Islam. And um, it's a month of fasting and it's uh, generally, it kind of shifts every year and over an extended period of time, it'll even move to completely different months. But basically it's like, a, it's, it's, if you're a Christian, it kind of is like Lent, sort of. 
Um, but the idea is that you, um, you know, you uh, you abstain from a lot of different things throughout the the lifetime of these thirty or day, thirty or so days, and so um, there is a video that uh, that we want to play that talks about how it impacts what's happening in the DRC with this civil war and with the conflict is how it's uh, how it's impacting everyday lives. So um, indigenous religious, uh, including indigenous religious observances. So millions of Congolese have been um, intern internally displaced by the fighting in the East, including Muslims who amid the humanitarian catastrophe are struggling with the holy month of Ramadan. This is supposed to be a time of fasting, but with food anyway scarce, breaking the fast in the mornings and even evenings as, the, as traditional is barely an option. Um, Muslims are overcrowded in camps and, um, and in this video they share their ordeal. Um, so let's go ahead and play the video and then we can react to it um, briefly. Relocating with his family from Sake, the war-torn eastern province of Congo, which is predominantly Muslim. It is Ramadan and he is fasting despite the war and food being scarce. They are now at a refugee camp in Goma with his pregnant wife and young daughter. Through his observation of the fast, his family will have one less mouth to feed. This gives him some relief as there are barely enough rations of rice and sardines to go around. First, I am grateful for God's grace for allowing my wife not to observe the fast due to her pregnancy. The food scarcity that's befallen us is a great burden. It's great even though I am fasting. M23 rebels have advanced in Sake, making it uninhabitable. Hence, most people have fled to Goma for safety. At the Lake Vert camp in Goma, Kakandi and his family join thousands of others displaced by the conflict since 2022. Sheikh Musa Ahmed Mabande is a Muslim leader in northeastern Kivu. There is a war in the Sake region, which is a cradle of Islam in this province of North Kivu. It's the location of the first mosque in the region and is home to many Muslims. Because of the war, most of the Muslims have fled to safety in the camps. It is increasingly difficult for us to provide any meals, especially during the Ramadan period. We are even unable to provide enough for breaking the fast. During these tough times, people still have their faith. They've put up makeshift mosques in the camps as distribution points for whatever little they manage to acquire. Hadida Binti Ibrahim Kolunyere is one of those whose houses was destroyed in Sake. She is finding the conditions hard for fasting. Our circumstances are very difficult. There's no food to break the fast for our children. We have nowhere to find food and if we go back to Sake, the rebels would attack us. She says she would like to be back home and prays for peace for this to be possible. Despite this glimmer of hope waning for most people due to the prevailing circumstances. Yeah, so I mean, you can see, obviously, it's very difficult. So like one, one of the things that, um, you know, people here in Sierra Leone who, uh, and I've seen even people around the world, when, when they're breaking fast, that they, they look forward to being able to eat in the, in the early morning, or in the evening, right? Uh, and imagine you're trying to break fast and there is no food to break fast with, right? Uh, you know, it's already tough to go the whole day without eating. Some people go the whole day without drinking water as well. And so if there's no clean water or very scarce water and there's no food to break your fast, it's very difficult. So um, I just wanted to say that. I know, I, I know that there are a lot of comments here um, folks having some things to say. Do we wanna try to go through some of these comments as you mentioned? Um, yeah, I see a few. Um, I see one from, uh, I hope I say this correctly, Yohe Mbuyu that says, Congo DRC lost over 22 million people from the invasion of their country by Rwanda and Uganda, backed by US and Europe, and the world is still silent about it. Um, so I just really just like the, the death toll um, is incredibly high. You know, I, um, I don't know off the top of my head the exact death toll, but I do know it's in the millions since I believe uh, like around the mid nineties. I have to fact check exactly what the statistic is, but it is millions of lives um, from this, uh, this I guess conflict. I, I don't even like the word. It feels like, it doesn't feel like the right word, but I see another comment from Susie Siluk. Those wealthy countries profiting from this racketeering should be encouraged to address the destruction of the DRC. And unfortunately, unless they're forced to, they never will. I mean, 
right. it really is a question of you know how being forced to but yeah Masi Main also says that Congo is definitely the heart of Africa. That's why it has always been the primary source of exploitation uh, on the continent. If Congo is better, then the entire Africa will be better. I mean, I just look at, you know, from the time of Leopold and the Congo Free State and the level of violence that that was through the, you know, Belgians basically uh, continuing that same violent colonial rule to the era of Patrice Lumumba and how brutally he was killed you know um it's just it's like it's just cycles of just non-stop uh uh serious like violence um and and very strong like forms of colonial and neo-colonial rule um and imperialism just targeting the drc just d generations and generations now of, of serious um trauma to the land and the people Absolutely. Uh, and there's, a, there's a few other comments. Uh, so a question from Susie Saluk, and she's asking any recent signs of aid reaching the DRC? And then a the follow up to that was, uh, who is honest and trustworthy in the DRC uh, for receipt, uh, receipt of and distribution of aid? Any suggestions? Do you, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, so I know like one major organization that is uh, like that uh, I have some connection where like I know some people who are involved in is Friends of Congo. Um, so you can find them on social media and they have like very large campaigns giving to the DRC. Another one, it's it's smaller, but I trust it a lot. Uh, there's an organization, it's based in Canada, but it's connected to a group in Kinshasa uh, and it's called United African Diaspora. And they're currently fundraising um, for like medical sorts of supplies, types of things like uh, I think along the lines of like diapers, sanitary pads, these kinds of things to uh, send to the DRC. So those are the two off the top of my head, Friends of Congo and United African Diaspora, which currently has a campaign um, connected to an organization called Comite um, out of the DRC. Awesome, and we'll be sure to put those in the comments, I mean, in the in the descriptions afterwards, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll add that for you guys so you guys can, can review that. Um, okay, so uh, I think there was, um, I'm trying to think if there are any other comments that I think are useful to the discussion, and I think that's it for now. I know we are basically at time. We wanted to talk about uh, Gaddafi and what his uh, former advisor said, but I think we are out of time. So what we can do is potentially talk about that um, on the next live. If you guys want to, if you guys are interested in these kinds of conversations and you find them useful, make sure you join us every Monday at 3 p.m. GMT. Uh, that is what 11 a.m. EST and 8 a.m. Pacific. Am I right? Um, and so, you know, I think that it, these these are the kinds of conversations we'll be having every week, and we'll be sure to uh, update you on all the stories as we get updates and we see what is going on. Um, any final words or any thoughts before we go, Ina? Um, I think it was, you know, I think it was great. I guess since we didn't cover the Gaddafi story, I'd tell people to check it out. There was a podcast that African Stream did recently um, for it. I mean, the podcast is called Pan-African uh, Pan Attitude. And uh, they did an episode with uh, Muammar Gaddafi's former advisor. So we were hoping to talk about some of it, but check it out. Um, and we, maybe we'll talk about it um, in the future. Um, and yeah, subscribe to both African Stream, um, subscribe to Authentic African, like, you know, keep, you know, keep up with the show. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And so we'll be back next Monday with more uh, news and content for you guys to review and to keep up to date. So, I um, mean, we'll be having clips of these uh, as well. So for those of you who can't consume the whole live, um, clips of Enem's great responses and insights will be up on all the platforms, uh, specifically on Authentic African, and then you'll be able to find them in the stories on African Stream, and then eventually they'll be in um, African Stream's Stream. Uh, and so with that, um, we will call it a day for today. If you know anybody who who's interested in any news around Africa, make sure you share this with them. Send this to at least three people that you know. Hit that thumbs up so you can say, um, so that the, the platforms know that you found this interesting and they can share this with other people who have similar interests. And of course, as Enam said, subscribe to both of our channels to ensure that you stay up to date on the latest. So with that, guys, thanks for watching. We will see you all on the next video.